want to position um, Sophia, the skills framework for the information age. Um, who's heard of Sophia in the room? All fair few. Okay, good. So it won't take a lot of positioning if you all know about it. I might as well stop now. Shall I stop now? No. Okay, um, talk a bit about mentoring and then we'll see it in action. Yes, yeah. okay, so Sophia, for those that know, just forgive me for a minute, uh, because even I find that even those that know Sophia um, don't necessarily know everything that it's used for and the ways in, in which you, you can use it. So, um, the skills framework for the information age is what it says, it is a framework, therefore you don't just use it exactly as it's written in the book, you can use it in a lot of different ways. So sometimes within the skills management cycle, if we look at the top, when you're, as an organization, when you're recruiting people, you can use it to um, specify um, some of the characteristics, some of the professional skills that you need in the people that you are recruiting, whether they're on a permanent basis or on a contract basis or temporary workers, a whole host of ways that you can use it in acquiring people. Um, I was out in Australia in August and I saw a really good example of this in action as um, a recruitment consultancy that actually trained their recruiters in Sophia. And what happens is when they have um, a, a customer come on who's after recruiting someone, they listen to them describe the role and they pick out the key Sophia skills. So they use Sophia as a way of standardizing the skills that they're looking for, so they specify the skills and the levels that they need. And then what they do when they have a candidate coming along, rather than just taking the CV or the resume as uh, uh, the Bible and, and doing the normal word search that you find with recruitment consultants doing, um, I, don't, I don't know if any of you get, get this, I, I, I get phone calls um, asking me if I'm interested in a service desk analyst role, to which my response is, have you read my CV? Um, and they said, well, we, we've got your CV, um, it's probably quite an old one because you've been looking for a job for years, but um, it came up on a word search. It's like, yes, if you read it properly, it said I was the global program manager for the implementation of the service desk. So they've just matched up the service desk a bit. That, we have to face it, that is the general level of intelligence that goes on <coughs> in a lot of recruiting in our industry. It's word search based. What they were doing in this uh, in Australia was actually when the candidates come in, came in, they went through what their skills were and they used Sophia to say, ah, you've got these skills at these levels. Having done that with the organisations that were looking to recruit, they suddenly had a really intelligent way of matching up the vacancy with the candidates. They were so confident in this way of matching up that they actually offer a 200% money back guarantee if the candidate doesn't stay for a year, I think it is, it's six months or a year, I can't remember which. They're that confident and they're still in business, so it must be working. Yeah. If it weren't working, they'd be out of business having given them a 200% rebate. Um, so th there's some really exciting uses of Sophia that are starting to catch on um, and uh, in, in either the adverts for jobs, just say, I've seen a few around that have said I'm looking for somebody that's got whatever the skill is, change management level 4, whatever it might be. So there, there are some adverts that do it at a very crude level like that. There are some organisations like, like this recruitment company in Australia that I mentioned that are doing it at a much more detailed level. So it, it can really help the quality there in the whole acquisition part. Then if you move on to the next part of the cycle, if you're um, in the organisation and maybe you're looking for some people to assign to a project, or even on a service desk or a support function, you're looking to identify the people that have got certain skills so that they can take the call that's most relevant to the skills they've got, you can use Sophia in that way. You can use it around continual professional development, and that's what we'll be talking about a bit more today, uh, because mentoring, if you're a mentee, um, you are actually trying to do continual professional development, because you're recognizing some gaps that you need to fill. Yeah? So Sophia provides a framework where you can say, I know where I am, I know I've got these skills at these levels, I know that the way I want to progress in my career says I need these skills at these levels. You can do a gap analysis between between those and identify skills that you need. 
and with mentoring, you can actually um, ask for a mentor that's got experience in those areas where your gaps are. So, um, so you can do it around assessing the current performance, planning how you're doing your CPD, around analysing the, the gaps, uh, whether that's at a personal level or whether that's at an organisational level. So the organisation can do it as a whole and actually look at the skills they have at the moment, work out what skills they need in the future, taking into account any business changes that they have, and again, create a plan to close those gaps. So the, the development actions can be on a personal or, or an organisational level. Uh, there are some, uh, some organisations that are relating um, skill levels to the pay scales as well. Um, so I've seen a very interesting white paper that actually uh, uses the skill levels and works out a baseline price per skill point. And it actually is remarkably accurate. So if anybody's interested in those case studies, uh, come see me after as well or, or email me and I can give you links to those. So Sophia, as most of you know what it is, rather than going through the, the great detail of, uh, of, of how it's structured, I thought I'd cover some of the ways in which it's used very briefly there. Yeah, there we go. So uh, some people don't realise um, Sophia is effectively free to use in your organisation. Um, if, you, if you want to go and download it, you just have to put your email address and a couple of other details, you can download it, you can use it internally within your organisation to do all of those things I talked about. If you are going to use it for commercial gain, there is a separate licence uh, agreement, and you, there is a, a royalty and a commercial agreement that you have to enter into. But the majority of people are using it within their organisation, sort of for their own professional development, and you can do that within the, the standard user licence, which is free to use. So it's, it's a free resource, you haven't got to buy um, you know, lots of uh, big expensive books or CDs or subscriptions to things, it's actually uh, one of those rare um, free frameworks that's out there. The current version, version 5, describes 96 different professional skills. It goes right the way across the traditional service management stack around instant problem service desk, all of those, all of the, the service management skills but it also covers some of the, um, the other professional skills that we need in service management that might not be thought of as service management. So things like account management, relationship management, you know, it's one of those that sometimes sits on the edge, of project management, program management, all of the strategic and, and innovation and, and data type skills. It's a whole range of things. So fear of, uh, within those 96 skills, they believe that covers all of the professional skills that are needed in an ICT It's regularly updated, it's written by practitioners that use it. Um, there's a, a very active user group who um, regularly um, put in ideas for improving it, and that's how the next version gets created. It's fairly plain language, doesn't use, uh, uh, doesn't use a lot of technical terms, uh, terminology in there. And it's, it's translated into many different languages, so it's used a lot around the globe. It's growing in some areas, it's fairly well established in others, so uh, there's a lot of use around the globe. So, um, as most of you know about Sophia, you probably know it's been around over 10 years, and, and that's just a bit on the history of, of where it's come from, so I'm not going to dwell on that too much. Um, it's still, the current version has the six different categories, so those 96 skills sit within those those six severe categories, and each skill is described at one or more of these seven levels, um, going from one being the, the, the most basic to seven the most um, uh, experienced or, or detailed. So not all skills will sit across all seven levels, um, some of them will sit across one, two, three, four, whatever it might be. So when, when you use Sphere to create a role profile, uh, this, is, this is also one of the common misconceptions that Sphere skills equal jobs. So if you read a project management skill, that equals a project <coughs> management role, but it doesn't. Because a project management role requires several skills, one of them being project management, but 
probably some communications and relationship management, maybe you know, a number of different skills depending on the, the particular project management role or job that's out there. So the, the way Sophia has used is professional skills at the different levels, um, give you some of that, you then build those skills into a role profile and then use it into a job description. So it's usually that, that type of sequence. <coughs> And the uh, same can be used by individuals, it can be used by, by people that are uh, managing teams or hiring people, so HR departments. Um, how often do we, we get told that uh, IT, you know, HR can't really manage IT because we don't really understand what those companies do. Uh, we're, we're seen as fabrics and strange people with beards and sandals that sit in the corner and just play with the technology sometimes. But uh, um, actually, I think, I think uh, Sophia, provides a way that HR can better engage with IT as well, because it doesn't use the techno babble, it actually uses plain English and allows us to bridge that gap. So there's, there's something in it for HR departments and recruiters and all that, as well as those of us in, in an ICT industry. So as I say, I'm st starting to see some jobs advertised using Sophia. Um, there are a number of training companies who are actually using Sophia to um, identify uh, what their training courses, particular courses, are aimed to do. So whilst, whilst you can never develop a whole skill just by going on a training course, um, the training can give you some of the information that helps you to develop that skill. So you will find that, that some, some training organisations will say this course is designed to help you this skill level five, whatever it might be. So that's starting to happen. Um, we're, we're also seeing uh, university uh, universities use it to benchmark their offerings. Um, the Open University recently did a, an exercise where they used Sophia to look at all of the things that they did across their courses, and they identified some key gaps against Sophia. They identified some skills that they weren't addressing, and they used that to create some skills, that are some courses to fill those gaps. So there's some, there's some good uses around. Credentialing, mentoring and CPD we're covering a bit today. Um, if you are uh, wanting to do your continual professional development, the first logical thing to do is to baseline where you are at the moment. Sophia can be used to baseline where you are and it can also be used to plan that development cycle. And there's a, there's a new service that's being launched um, by ITSMF. It's going to be available um, in the UK chapter, but, but also several other chapters around the globe. Um, we're just launching it at the moment, and it actually uh, um, works on two levels. One is a, as an individual, you can, um, you can pay, um, I think it's, I forget the price, it's 30 or $40, that sort of uh, figure, so it's fairly low um, entry point with a discount for ITSMF members. Um, and you can go online in your browser, answer a load of questions, and once you answer the questions on the skills that you've got are the most relevant ones, you will then get an email with an attachment that is a personalized Sophia-based profile. It's your baseline. So it describes, um, describes where you are. I might show that on the screen in a minute if I have time, or, or after the mentoring session, just to give you a view of that. So um, that's Sophia. There's, if you want to know more about Sophia itself, there's that uh, sophia.org.uk, uh, which is a bit misleading because it is actually used uh, very widely outside of, outside of the UK. But so there you go, that was, that was the origins and that explains the domain name. Uh, the Sophia Foundation, who owns Sophia, also uh, maintain a list of accredited consultants and partners, and, they, and there are training courses available. Sophia. All of those details are on that Sophia website as well. We have on the ITSMF stand here, there's a, there's a small pocketbook introduction to Sophia, the blatant plug. Yeah, what's the blatant plug? I, yes, I did happen to write the pocketbook. Okay, so I have to declare the interest. Um, I don't make any money out of it, no royalties, wasn't paid to do it, so I, I feel justified in, in uh, plugging it. Um, so that, that book is available on the ITSMF stand. If you want to know a bit about Sophia, it gives you an introduction, and there's also a couple of chapters on how you can use Sophia, particularly in a service management environment. I've used service management examples, 
um, and it's really, it really uh, includes some of the tips from me and from other people having used it over the, over the last 10 plus years of how not to use it as well as how to use it. Okay, so there's a, there's a few tips in there. So that, that might be worth looking at if, if you want to have a look at that, go to the stand. So very quickly on mentoring. So men, mentoring, I'm going to uh, introduce it with about two, two or three minutes left. So mentoring is where you get two people working together in a non-judgmental way to try and share experience and knowledge and help enhance um, the mentee's um, position from where they are. It also, I find that mentors get as much out of it as possible. You may, may find, people often find that when they have to describe what they do, they actually think, oh, that's, I've, I've really, I've actually something's clicked and I've understood to something. And they, the, the mentor um, gets something out of it through just going through the process. It's also nice to see other people uh, advance as well to develop. So that's what mentoring is. It can be used for supporting that, that professional development either in short term or longer term, you know, your needs for mentoring change as you go through your career. It promotes that culture of lifelong learning, and it's about us as a community, particularly re relevant to ITSMF as a, a member-owned forum, to actually share our knowledge and help each other, which is really what we're about when we do these types of events and mentoring. Okay, so it's successful when actually we are helping each other and doing all of those things that you can see there screen. We have a good structure, we have a mentoring handbook, we have a, a fairly robust process that makes sure that, that mentor relationship is protected and that people do it in an appropriate way and you know, when you've got people working together that sort of thing is very important and that's been done in line with the relevant uh, standards, as a particular European standard that uh, it gets used to uh, develop the mentoring scheme. So there's a code of ethics and there is a process for matching mentees to mentors. And that's, the, that's basically the process. And what we're going to see today um, I'm, it is a certain part of this process, which I think the guys are going to explain as they do it. So if it doesn't get, if it doesn't get covered too well, I, they're, they're looking at me strangely. You're going to cover this bit around just past establishing the relationship. So the mentor and mentee have already got a relationship. And what we're seeing is one of the many mentoring sessions that might happen. Now these can be done face to face, these can be done over the telephone, these can sometimes be done through email. All, people do things in lots of different ways. But this is part of the process and I'm going to hand over to Jerry and Adam to take us through that. Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. Now you can guess who's the mentor and who's the mentee. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Usually the mentor sits above. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> We're just ever small stage here, so. So, slightly, that's like a weird mentoring type of session. Uh, I've done various mentoring sessions, as uh, as you said. Um, uh, over the telephone, over uh, email, person to person. I've never done it in front of an audience. Um, it's, there's various things that I wouldn't generally do in front of an audience, and this is one of them. Um, um, so we're going to kind of, to some extent, almost ignore you. Please don't feel offended. Um, and it's going to be a bit sort of um, uh, Alas, Smith and Jones, just us talking to each other, uh, <coughs> like in the room. The, the premise is that um, I'm, the, I'm the mentee. Um, uh, and it is based on reality, although I'm not necessarily opening my heart to front of an audience. Um, my background is that I was, uh, for the majority of my life, employed as an employee uh, within an organisation. Um, and about three years ago, um, through one reason or another, um, I and my employment um, parted company. Um, I am now an independent consultant um, and I, I guess trying to deal with the, the repercussions of that and what it means uh, in terms of my career progression. So that, that kind of gives you the, the scenario of the, the situation. 
partnered, partnered up with Jerry uh, through the Prison Mentoring. Uh, we've had various common, uh, conversations about um, where I am, what I need to be thinking about. Uh, and we're going to basically go through one of the, maybe a 10 minute, uh, one of the conversations that we may have, just to give us an idea of um, how, how frank it may be and, and how the process actually works. Okay? So, Jerry. Okay, just to, to add a little bit to that is that, uh, uh, as it has been pointed out by Matthew before, it's a one-to-one -one session. So usually I have to support that. Uh, when you just said that uh, in a one-to-one -one session, you're first of all you have to establish trust. Yeah, because otherwise it just doesn't work. I mean, you can call someone mentor, you can call someone mentee, you can call it coach, whatever you want. It just does not work if you don't click. Just simple as that. So, in, in the process before, just to, to follow that up, how is a mentor and mentee matched? Uh, there's profiles and there's selections that have been made up front, like someone needs a mentor or would like to have or support by a mentor. And the other way around, you have people who say, like, okay, I would like to give back. I would like to support maybe one had a mentor before. For example, myself, I had for very, very long time, over decades of years, I had my grandfather, which was my mentor. And uh, this usually, things like that is nothing new. It just happens usually in the family. So you have, might have someone that has been there and supportive and good or even bad or helping you with that. So that, that's sort of all, not that I'm his grandfather, don't get me wrong. <laughs> uh, but in general, it's the relationship. You need, you need, well, talk to that later. Uh, you need trust. You have to establish a relationship. In the process, uh, you don't just say, Adam, this is your mentor, or Jerry, this is Adam, he's your mentor. You talk first. You meet virtual or in person, you meet first. And then you just get to know each other a little bit. And then the mentee is the one who leads and says, okay, that's fine with me. I'm the one. I agree with that mentor. Of course, the mentor could also say, nah, no way. That just doesn't work. But the lead is the mentee. Because you give and he takes or she takes. So therefore, I think that's a very important message uh, that should be brought over to understand how that works. So, all this has been done. So, what we do here right now is I'm trying to give ideas, thoughts, help, support, experience to Adam's situation. Okay. So, the situation I'm in at the moment is um, I'm a very good consultant. Um, I can go out, I can do any aspect of um, service management, but about winning business, how do I actually? Because you know, I've always had salespeople go out and effectively just being told, right now deliver this service. I can go through an associate network, but obviously they're going to take their, their cream off the top. Right. Um, I'd prefer to actually win my own business, but it's scary. It's scary as hell actually approaching companies. How do I? Where do I start? Well, the first thing one should understand, or what you should understand, is that you're switching from a position where it's like, let's say it's a, something like a safe harbor someone else is taking care of their revenue coming in mm -hmm. and the work you're doing. Now you switch over if you want it or not, but you're an entrepreneur. And that's a totally different situation. You are doing this making up one of the stuff, but you are. If you sell your services, your knowledge, your projects, you're an entrepreneur. So there based on my experiences that you have to change your point of view which means going back out, I sometimes call it comfort zone, mm -hmm. because it is comfortable in a way. You can also hide a little bit in a, in a corporate or in a public good. It's like you have to go out and sell yourself. And that's sometimes hard for people to start selling themselves. I mean, you just said, I'm a good consultant. Yeah. I did a lot of things. Yeah. This is already selling. But behind that selling, we all know a lot of stories. Are there any salespeople in here? I'm no? a consultant. I sell myself. Okay, yeah, good. But I mean, salespeople <laughs> that don't deliver. You use that phrase carefully. I sell myself. It doesn't. I just said this for Matthew because he's already got me on a couple of them. <laughs> you're actually your multiple personality. 
you want it or not. Because yes, you totally your cool, yeah. marketing, mm -hmm. your sales, your consultant. Mm -hmm. So what you need to do is like you're selling yourself, but then you have to prove it. Which sales very often don't. <coughs> they don't have to do that. They sell. They say deliver. So right now, what you're you're stepping over the line, as we say. It's like you're it's unknown, it's a desert, it's unknown country. How am I going to do this? Yeah. And the first question you need to ask yourself is what's my portfolio? What am I selling? You say, I'm a good consultant. I did a lot of things. But what is your portfolio? What is it you're selling? Are you selling consultancy on what? Uh, Building houses. I, I can't do that. Well, I um, yeah, mainly in mainly in ISO 20000, ITIL, service management, any of the, the disciplines within those, um, but also project management. And th this is the problem, that um, I, I will probably end up um, diffusing any of the messages that I put across, because um, if I list down all the things that I have done, could do, could sell myself that, then I'll end up with this huge list. And if I don't do that, then I'm denying myself opportunities. So how do you how do you get that balance? Well, one thing is that you just name some frameworks like I said, 20,000, mm -hmm. I tell, I tell. Er, that's, that's your job. You have to be in. You have to know that to be able to deliver anything in that area. Yeah. But this is not a solution. You're delivering the customer. You can't go to a customer and say, I do ISO 20,000. OK. Uh, what's the solution? What's the value you're delivering to a company? If you would go there and say, like, for example, my selling aspect or my value proposition is I help you to have a leaner organization and deliver better quality. That would be, for example, a USP. Yeah. But based on that, you have to prove it. Which means you have to ask up there where you, either you already know where you're at and the company's at, so you can put out that statement saying that I can deliver, or I help you to deliver, train more, effectiveness, saving money, whatever the goal of the company is. Okay. But for that, you have skills. For example, social skills also, because ISO 20,000. That doesn't save you any money, or do you think ISO 20,000 would save you any money? Does ISO save you any money? Does a consultant save you money? No, a costume money. yes. So the value, what's the value? What are we proposing? skills is being able to actually do it in a demonstrable way, but then built on top of that is the experience uh, yes. and actually being able to deliver something tangible uh, as the back of it. Um, I've kind of got all those, but I need to get them set in my head as to how they all relate. You're baking a cake. That's, no, no, that, that's, where, that's where you're doing. No, no, I mean, I mean that in a positive way. You're baking a cake. <coughs> you have flour, yeah. you have water, sugar, milk, whatever you need, eggs, egg yolks, egg white, whatever you need to make the cake. And now you have to put this all together to make a delicious cake. And sorting that out up front is like, okay, what do I want to deliver? Is it a chocolate cake? Is it a cheesecake? Is it a wedding cake with an icing on that? So what's, what's your portfolio and what's the goal? This is something we will not be able to solve that within 10 minutes. But these are things where you should think Excuse about. Me, we're having a, we're having a <laughs> private confidential <laughs> <laughs> conversation here. Yeah. Carry on in that session. We've got about five minutes left. I just want to make sure that people feel they've got, a, got enough of a flavor of what we mean on mentoring. Next to the chance for us. Sure. Yeah. Uh, are we okay to do that? Is that Absolutely. Right? Okay. So uh, I, I just want to make sure that you, you've got a chance to ask some <coughs> questions if you want to. 
you can see the type of relationship and the type of conversation that's going on there. Hopefully it's given you a flavor of it. Suzanne, you've got a question at the back. Actually, it's not a question. Um, what you guys just did was very difficult. And I just want to tell you, you did a great job. And I hope that people see, <laughs> people see the value of, of the mentor and the mentoree and, and that, that, that type of program and take advantage of it. So well done, guys. Yeah, it, it is extremely difficult to, to try and do, do that and put it on in front of the audience. And, and, uh, because it's a very personal thing, a very one-to-one. -one. You are bearing your soul, and, and, uh, and that's not something you really want to do with the audience, as Adam said. So, so that's good. Not, not again. Any other questions? Sandra? Yeah, I've got a million questions. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, I'm looking at one of your interviews. I Yeah, you know, not so much. 
on. So I think we've been kept honest on time. We've been kept honest on time. The clock has been this. Uh, there were small questions on the floor. At the bottom, Please come and talk to us. But I'm sure you can. So, um, once more, let's show our appreciation.